going to read from Acts chapter 13. It's a long portion of scripture, so follow with me as we read. We began Acts 13 last week, and we read from Acts 13, uh, from verse 1 to verse 3. And you would recall from that sermon last week, uh, sorry, we read from verse 4 uh, to verse 12. And you would recall from that sermon last week how Paul and Barnabas had gone to Cyprus and preached the gospel everywhere and to everyone. And the title of that sermon was, Preach the Gospel to Everyone, Everywhere. And I just want to let you know that I'm using that sermon on the final night of the conference in South Africa. And so they asked me, what is the title of the conference? Kanda, what theme shall we head it? Um, and so the title is Facing the Task Unfinished. It is the hymn that we sing in our church. Um, so Facing the Task Unfinished. Friday night, I'm teaching on um, preaching the gospel. Whose responsibility is it uh, to preach the gospel? That is what I'll be preaching on. Saturday afternoon, I'm teaching from um, Deuteronomy on um, biblical parenting. Again, the responsibility of the parent to evangelize their children first before they evangelize anybody else, which is what we teach in our church. And Saturday evening, um, uh, one of the brothers in South Africa who we, who we combined with, a uh, similar church to ours, uh, he's teaching on um, the true marks of the Holy Spirit, uh, trying to uh, uh, unravel, or not, not unravel, but trying to um, debunk some of the, the, the ideas that people have in South Africa about what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we're trying to bring some direction there. Uh, Sunday morning, I'll be preaching in a church in another part of the city. And Sunday evening, we come back to close the conference where I'll be preaching last week's sermon and adding a few more uh, to that content for the last night. So I know that you will pray, pray, with, pray for me and pray with me as I undertake that task. Let's read from verse 13. Now Paul and his companions put out to sea from Paphos and came to Persia in Pamphylia. But John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Going on from Persia, they arrived at uh, Pisidian Antioch. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. Now, I just want to be, make it clear right now that this Antioch that we're talking about is not the Antioch that the church was sent from. This Antioch is in Asia Minor. It's a different Antioch. Okay? And so we understand now that they sailed from Cyprus to another place. And this place is about 200 miles away from Cyprus. It's a long journey. They were on their way. And um, we're also understanding that in that text there that um, John Mark had left them. And uh, Luke doesn't tell us the reason why they had left them. But as you're going to discover later on in the book of Acts, uh, Paul wasn't pleased with that. Um, he wasn't pleased with John Mark's leaving. And so there was a, uh, a dispute that arose between him and Barnabas later on. And we will, just, we will come across that and we will learn how they resolved that dispute. So we find that in verse 15, after the reading, uh, so uh, let's, let's start from verse 14 again. But going on from Persia, they arrived at the city in Antioch. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue officials sent to them, saying, Brethren, if you have a, any word of exhortation for the people, say it. Paul stood up and motioning with his, with, his hand, with his hand said, Men of Israel and you who fear God, listen. The God of his people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt. And with an uplifted arm, he led them out from it. For a period of about 40 years, he put, put up with them in the wilderness. When he had destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan, he distributed their land as an inheritance, all of which took about 450 years. And these things he gave them, and after these things he gave them judges until Saul the prophet. Then they asked for a king, and God gave them Saul, son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for 40 years. After he had removed him, he raised up David to be the king, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found. David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. From the descendants of this man, according to the promise of God, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, after John had proclaimed before his coming a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. And while John was completing his course, he kept saying, what do you suppose that I am? I am not he. 
But behold, one is coming after me, the sandals of whose feet I am not worthy to untie. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family and those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. But those who live in Jerusalem and their rulers, recognizing neither him nor the utterance of all the prophets, which are dead, which, sorry, which are read every every Sabbath, fulfill these by condemning him. And though they found no ground for putting him to death, they asked Pilate that he be executed. And while they had carried out all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And for many days he appeared to those who came up with him from Galilee to, to Jerusalem, the very ones who are now his witnesses to the people. And we preach to you the good news of the promise made to the, to the fathers, that God has fulfilled his promise to our children in that he raised up Jesus, as it is also written in the second Psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As for the fact that he raised him up from the dead, no longer to return to decay. He has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David. Therefore, he also says in another psalm, you will not, you, you will not allow your holy one to undergo decay. For David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid among his fathers and underwent decay. But he whom God raised did not undergo decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through him forgiveness of sin is proclaimed to you. And through him, everyone who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. Therefore, take heed so that the thing spoken of in the prophets may not come upon you. Behold, you scoffers and marvel and perish. For I am, a, for I am accomplishing a work in your days, a work which you will never believe, though someone should describe it to you. As Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. And when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. The next Sabbath, nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when Jesus saw the crowds, so when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you. First, since you repudiated and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. Behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us. I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the end of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed, and the word of the Lord was being spread through the whole region, but the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. The disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. It is important. This is the reading of God's word. Church said, Amen. It is important that we read that entire context, the entire portion for you to understand the full story here. There is a vast amount of stuff that preachers who are more qualified than I am have divided that text into not just one month, but six, seven weeks of preaching because there's so many things that you could go through. Um, Paul is recalling the redemptive history here. He, there's so many things that we can talk about from Abraham uh, all the way down to David and then to Jesus. So there's so many things that we could talk about. But for the purpose of my sermon this morning, and to achieve the goal that we have set out in this series, I want to share with you 
um, that Paul's sermon here um, was set out in an easily understandable manner. The reason why we read the entire thing was to show you how Paul had preached his sermon. And I wonder whether you recall, you've, asked, you've been asked this question in your Bible study, and I wonder whether you got the answer right. I wonder if you recall the person who made a similar presentation, a similar, had a similar approach when preaching the gospel. It was Stephen. Stephen, before he was stoned, he set out in the preaching of the gospel. And he set it out in a way that was easily understandable. Stephen knew his audience. And Paul also here knew his audience. He's talking to the Jews. And therefore, he uses key words. And he begins at a particular place in talking to them. And the title of the Bible study uh, last week and the title of the sermon today is What to Say, When to Say It, and How to Say It. And when we're preaching the gospel, it is important to know what to say. It is important to know when to say it, and it's important to know how to say it. And we learn here from Stephen, and we learn from his way, how he, how he presented the gospel. And I believe Paul here had a, Luke doesn't tell us this. This is just my belief and my understanding. You remember there was a young man that was standing there when Stephen was making his case. It was a young man who was holding the, co the coats and the cloaks of all the people who were stoning Stephen. Who was that man? It was Saul. Saul was listening to the way Stephen was presenting the gospel. Remember, Saul was a devout Jew, a man who was learned in the law. So he, you, you, cannot, you could not fault him in that. He knew the law. But here is Stephen presenting the case. And Paul is saying, that's true. That's true. That's true. And everything that Stephen was recounting, everything that he was going to with Scripture, I'm sure in Paul's mind, he was ticking out the box and saying, that's right. That's right. That's right. You got that right. And as he was accurately presenting the case of the Old Testament concerning the coming of the Messiah. So I believe Saul learned from that. And here he is now talking to Jews and is using the same method that Stephen used. Why? Because the Jews, could, Jews would understand certain things that, that uh, Paul was saying to them. And so he begins, when you begin to look at uh, Paul's uh, account, he says, Men of Israel, you who fear God, listen. And he asks for their attention. And one of the key things when you're preaching the gospel, and I shared this with, um, with the church that we joined with uh, in, uh, during uh, yeah, December time, and they asked us, they said, what can, what can we learn from you? And I said to them, brothers, you shot yourself in the foot when you started passing chocolates around to all the children. I said, because what you've done there is you've taken the attention away from the word of God. What you really want to say is, listen, people of God, I have something to tell you. And by passing chocolates around, what you did was you drew people's attention away from what you're saying to what the chocolates were, correct? So you're looking in the box, it was a celebration box. Okay, which one is mine? I'll have the coconut, oh, that one looks nice, I don't want that, Maltesers, oh, that looks nice. So what happened? You took your attention away from what the preacher was trying to say. Here, Paul is, is getting the attention of the, of the people. Men of Israel, listen, you who fear God, listen to what I'm about to say to you. When you're preaching the gospel, it is important to find that right place where you get the attention of the people, the attention of the person you want to uh, preach the gospel to. Sometimes things would come in to distract you, and you have to be patient concerning those things. You have to find that moment in that time, in that season, in that conversation, where you can strike. And when you strike, your, 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 your strike is sharp, and it achieves the goal that you set out to achieve. And here, Paul begins to say, Men of Israel, you will fear God. Look at verse, that's verse, the end of verse 16, or the latter part of verse 16. Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of His people, Israel, chose our fathers. And he goes back to the fathers. He goes right back, well, not right back to the beginning, but he goes to the beginning. And he talks about how God delivered them out of Egypt. And so he starts to uh, uh, go on this journey. Now, he doesn't go into the journey as Stephen did. Stephen went further into it. He expound, expounded more on it. Paul doesn't here, but he, he gives them enough information for these Jews to really say, okay, we understand what you are saying here right now. And so the point I'm trying to make here, the first lesson that we learn is 
when you're presenting the gospel, when you're preaching the gospel, whoever you're preaching to, um, uh, present it in a way that is understandable. What I try to do every week when I preach and what I'm teaching our elders and our deacons to do is to weave a tapestry, to weave a picture, or to paint a picture, to weave a tapestry. When it's presented to you, if it's finally finished, you see the picture. Maybe at the beginning, you didn't see the picture, but by the time we get to the end, you see the picture and you say, okay, now I get what you're saying. So we're building one on top of the other until you finally see what the picture is. And when you're presenting the gospel, you don't just strike there, and you don't just strike there, and you don't just talk about this, and you don't just talk about that. And that is what I was sharing with our brother here when we're talking to Jehovah's Witnesses and people like that. You don't try and change. When they try and change the topic, say, hold on a moment. We can come back to that at another time. We can set two hours for that. But right now, let's talk about this right now. One of the ways, that, one of the reasons they do that is to distract you from the point that you've just made, which is a valid point that they can't answer to. And so they try and distract you with something else and you quickly take the bait and you jump onto that because you can answer it. But what you fail to do is finish the picture that you're trying to paint here. So, so finish the picture here. Paint, build one, one uh, 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 scripture on top of another and show this wonderful correlation between the Old Testament and the New uh, how, how, that's, that's, what, that's what Stephen did. That's what Paul is doing here. And he's weaving this wonderful picture. And as he's doing that, people are beginning to understand. And even somebody who even at the beginning may not have agreed with what Paul is saying. But as he begins to paint that picture, as he begins to weave that tapestry in their mind, as they're getting convicted by the Spirit, they can see that picture forming. So we have to present the gospel in a way that is understandable in a way where the picture develops in a systematic way when preaching the gospel remain systematic is what I put in my notes here remain systematic build build your case build your case why you start why is why why is man a sinner and why is man in need of a savior build your case block by block thought by thought Further, what we see here is when you begin to read on, what we begin to see here is that Paul spoke the word of God. Towards the end of chapter 13, um, in, even in verse 48, when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And so here you find that, and when they were asked, when they were asked in verse 15, after the reading of the law and of the prophets, and, and the synagogue officials sent to them saying, Brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say it. And Paul stood up, motioning with his hand and said, Men of Israel, and he began to speak. And when he began to speak, he did not speak um, his doctrine. He did not speak his ways. The point I'm trying to make is he spoke the word of God. Brethren, dear church, we have, we've, we've come out of a, a, a type of church where testimony was very badly used. Testimony time was very badly used. Your testimony is a vital part of who you are. But when you share your testimony without the, the, the content of the word of God, it, it means nothing. Your testimony needs to have the word of God. Your testimony needs to be this. Uh, I once belonged to the devil, the world, and the flesh. But God saved me. You remember we covered that, that text. And that is, that is your testimony. But if you, don't, if you don't include the word of God there, it's lacking the vital ingredient for the, for the breaking of a man's heart. It's the word of God that crushes, as Jeremiah tells us. And so we could very easily give a testimony and talk about our experience with, and exclude the word of God. Here Paul is not talking about his Damascus Road experience. Paul is not talking about what a glorious encounter he had on that Damascus Road. Oh, there was another time where he would talk about that. But even in that, he almost downplays the experience and pushes forward the, the, the main thing that he wants to get across is who Jesus Christ is. And so the word of God is so important here uh, that we don't just speak 
our words, but we speak the word of God. We make the regular reference to who Jesus Christ is. We must be able to go to the word to be able to, to speak the word. So what is the application here? Uh, we must be careful that in our effort to see someone saved, we don't just give our, our testimony um, uh, and our experience of uh, salvation, uh, but, but show how salvation came. Be able to demonstrate through scripture how salvation came through the preaching of the word. And the preaching of the gospel always involves words. And, and we must make sure that those words are God's word and not just our words. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15 with me. Put your bookmark on, uh, on Acts 13 and go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. Accurately handling the word of truth. Your Bible say that? Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. Accurately handling the word of truth. In other words, you have to be trained in the word of God. That's what we're trying to do in our sermons. That's what we're trying to do in our Bible study is to show you how to accurately present the Word of God, how to accurately divide the Word of God to, to, to move you closer towards being that approved workman as uh, Paul describes here to uh, Timothy. And he says, be diligent to present yourself. And we know that diligent involves routine. Diligent involves discipline. Diligent involves structure. Diligent involves systematic. You have to set out to do it, you know, you know, when you try to get your education in something, you don't say, well, I'll see, I might pitch up, I may not pitch up, I'll go to lectures, I may not go to lectures, let's just see what happens. You don't do that. No, you're systematic in what you're doing. You're building one on top of the other. You're learning one skill and then another skill and then another skill until you are qualified to be at that place. And so Paul is talking to Timothy here and encouraging the young pastor as he leads this church on, on how to grow the church and how to grow not just the size of the church, but the quality of the church. So not just the quantity, but the quality of the church. So grow these men and women uh, to be diligent workers, uh, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it's important to do that. And so if you're going to speak the word, you have to know the word. You get that today. Some of the other things we learn here is that in here, Paul, if you go back to Acts 13, Paul is in the synagogue. Um, he finds himself at the synagogue. It says in verse... In verse 14, but going on from Persia, they arrived at Pisidian Antioch. And on the Sabbath day, they went into the synagogue and, 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 and sat down. This is, this, is, this is really interesting. This is really remarkable. This is the life that Paul is deliv was delivered from. This is Judaism that he was delivered from. Uh, and this group of religious people that he's delivered from. But he goes into the very place and the very thing that is delivered from and sits down with them on their Sabbath day. What is the lesson here? We find that it's an opportunity that he has as he goes to sit down with them and he, as, God opens the, the, as God opens the door through the leading men in the synagogue to say, brethren, do you have something to tell us? Paul seizes the opportunity as a God moment, as an ordained moment, to open his mouth and begin to declare the word of God. The lesson is, you would think that Paul would be, this would be the last place that Paul would be in. God has delivered us from various people, from false religion, from various situations. But I think that God also calls us from time to time to visit those people, to visit those situations for the purpose of preaching the gospel. 
after all, when you, uh, when you were delivered, when I was delivered, you and I realized how barren we were in that state, how thirsty we were for God. But we were not finding God. We did not have our thirst satisfied through what we were hearing and what we were receiving. But now in Christ, you and I are satisfied. We're in Christ. Why? But because we have the, the living water. We have the bread of life. And now it's important for us to take that living water, to take that bread of life to the people who don't have it, who need it. And that's the preaching of the gospel. But there are people, like we said last week, there are cisterns without any water and the mist driven away by the storm. So when the opportunity arises, brethren, for you to go back to talk to some of the people that um, you, 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 uh, you left, seize the opportunity and preach the gospel. Another lesson we learn here is their perseverance despite the great opposition. Man, when, I, when you read Paul and Barnabas, when you read the account of the apostles and the early church, my goodness did they face a vast amount of opposition. We go, we start off in verse 13. He, he's not just in the previous chapters, but here even in verse 13. They're preaching the gospel. They come across the, the, in, in, in Cyprus, this, this idle, driven island where sexual immorality is rampant every day, everywhere. Uh, you know, and they have opposition to preaching the gospel. They preach the gospel to Sergius Paulus, and then they have opposition from this false prophet, Elimus. They, they move on 200 miles further. They come to another location and they preach the gospel. And then you find that there is opposition towards the end of chapter 13. Um, we begin to read from verse 48. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. And when the word of the Lord was being spread from the whole region... But the Jews incited the devout women of, of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. You find that, um, and if you, look at, if you look at verse verse 44, and the next Sabbath nearly the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. So here's the situation. These religious men who were heading up the things in the city, who were the, who were the religious gurus of the time, who controlled the people for years, now have a problem. What they were serving every week was dry, was barren. People were attending, but they could not find any life in it. And so you find Paul gets up and he speaks, and as he opens his mouth, something breaks in the hearts of the people. Something breaks in their understanding. They said, oh, is that what that means? And they find life in it. And now suddenly, the, the, the amount of people that are coming have now doubled. The whole city is coming together to hear Paul speak the word of God. And these religious men, these Jews now become jealous. They're jealous. They're jealous of Paul and Barnabas and they're jealous of the word of God. I think the jealousy was just this. We couldn't do for years what you've done in one meeting. You've changed everything in one meeting. Week after week after week, we're getting up and we're reading this, but nothing's happening. We're reading this and we're, seeing, we're not seeing life. And here, here we find that, that Paul gets up. And he speaks the word of God under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's a saved man. He's in Christ. He speaks that. And people are starting to listen. So these men were jealous. But they were not jealous, just jealous. They were jealous to the point of blasphemy. And so here Paul and Barnabas face great opposition. And it seems like in every juncture... Of their life, these apostles uh, faced a battle. If they were not opposed with words, they were opposed with beatings. But, but church, we don't find them giving up and walking away. After Cyprus, they sailed further. After this island, when they were they when when the women were incited to to incite the crowd uh, to say, "Hey, you 
blasphemy or you're preaching against us or whatever. And they started to persecute Paul and, and Barnabas and, 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 and drove them away. Uh, Paul and Barnabas did not say, hey guys, listen, you know what? We've had enough of this right now. Let's go back to Antioch. Let's go back to our home church where we can sit comfortably, listen to the word of God. We can sing our lovely songs and tell each other uh, how much God loves us and give somebody a great big God bless you and shake hands and enjoy the tea and coffee. And we can have just great fellowship. Why are we putting up with this? We're getting beaten. We're getting stoned. We have vulgar words that are, are spoken to us. People are persecuting us. They're driving us out. Let's just go back to our home church. Let's just go back and relax. Did they do that? No. They sailed from one place to the next. The missionary journey continues. This is what God had called them to do. There was great perseverance in there. Brethren, there are people who, who will knock you down for preaching the gospel. They will arrest you for preaching the gospel. They will spit in your face for preaching the gospel. They will unfriend you on Facebook for preaching the gospel. They will say all sorts of things about you for preaching the gospel. They will say you're a Jesus freak or something. They will say, oh, but you're, you're, you're too serious about God or whatever the case may be. I don't know what the lingos are out there that people are calling us right now but whatever they call us it is not a reason to give up on preaching the gospel it is not a reason just to, to just run back to the church and hide but run back to the church and be encouraged and be sharpened to step out again on a sunday after service back out into the world on monday morning to preach the gospel these men did not give up they persevered they didn't say we've had enough and let's just give up no but they persevered to preach the gospel we'll get to the end of chapter 13 do you mind if i close here we get to the end of chapter 13 and we find that they've rejected the gospel so much even though so many people have come to hear Paul. This was life coming out of them. They were preaching the gospel. Verse 44 says the next Sabbath, uh, sorry, verse 42 says as Paul and Barnabas were going out, the people kept begging that these things might be spoken to them the next Sabbath. And when the meeting of the synagogue are broken and many of the Jews and the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas who spoke to them were urging them to continue in the grace of God. They knew the grace of God was upon Paul and Barnabas. They knew the words that were coming out of them were words of life and church. We have to trust that. We have to trust that this, you do not have to you do not have to try to uh, um, uh, uh, enrich your words more than what it is. God has been saving people long before you and I arrived. The word of God has been preached by faithful Christians long before you and I arrived. And people were being saved. Not because the Christian put extra lights on in church. Not because the Christian did an extra song in the service. Not because the Christian made the words more fancy. No, it was when the Christian spoke the word. It's the word that has life. It is the word that brings life. And so we must continue to not be afraid to preach the word. And you might say something so simple from the word and you think, is that enough to save somebody? And let me tell you right now, that's all that may be needed at that time. Is to just speak that simple word and it will be that word that will trouble that person when they leave or or trouble that person right there and break their heart and they will come to salvation and so do not be afraid to speak the word and here paul is speaking the word and the people encourage them to continue in that grace and the next sabbath so the so the, here they are a week later spending time there a week later they come together and they find that nearly now the whole city is assembled so the word has spread in the city that hold on you need to come and listen to this there's a revival happening in a way here. There's a revival. I've often said this even, even in the old church when we used to speak about revival. In my heart, I would say, people falling all over the floor in the Pentecostal church is not revival. We don't need that. We don't need just 
you know, people see, well, the things that we were looking for in revival at that time were crazy. I, in my heart, I felt at that time the true revival was a people who would be in search of the Word of God. That they would come hungry for the Word of God. That they would tell the preacher, no, don't stop preaching. Carry on preaching. That they would say, I want to go to Bible study. Tell me, teach me more about the Bible. I really felt in my heart that even at that time, I believe God is working in my heart concerning that. And that is what I even pray for now. That if we're going to see that type of revival, or if the word revival is used in our prayer, that that may be our prayer. That people would come hungry for the Word of God. So you find people were coming to hear the Word of God. But as Paul and Barnabas were preaching, there were people that were receiving it and coming to salvation, and then there were people who were rejecting it. And we heard last week in the sermon the, the, the consequence of rejecting the Word of God. It's not an easy thing. We sh it, it should not be dealt with lightly. God does not deal with it lightly. You are rejecting the Word of God. You're rejecting God. And here you find that Paul and Barnabas, at the end of it, at the end of this um, uh, chapter, we find in verse 51, as they were being driven out of the place, the, the, the apostles, they, they shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And so we find here that it, 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 it's in reference to what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 10, when he sends the disciples out to preach the gospel. Remember, he spoke about when you go into a house and they receive you. And he says, when you go into a place and they do not receive you, shake the dust of your feet and walk away. Basically, what he, and again here, again here, Luke is referring to things that the Jews understand. And Paul is doing something that the Jews understand. This is what the Jews used to do. When the Jews used to travel out of their region into Gentile areas, Right? This is how prejudiced and racist the Jews were. They would come, they would come back to, to their own land, and before they crossed the border from the Gentile land into their own land, they would, they would come to the border and they would do that. They would shake the dust of their feet to say, I don't want the unholy heathen dust to actually travel with me to my own land. That's what they would do. They would reject, they would reject the un, ungodly ways, the, the heathen ways, by shaking the dust of their feet. And here Paul does that to them. He shakes the dust of their feet, of his feet, by saying to them, the very thing that you were doing to others, we are doing to you now, because you've not just rejected us, you've rejected God. You've rejected the word of God. And that was a major thing to do. But, but the wonderful, the, 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 the chapter wonderfully ends with, and the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And there's the thing, isn't it? That in the midst of our brother's great, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't, he might correct me for saying it is a great trial. It is a trial in the sense that there are very things that are, I've never in the, in the weeks that I've, this has happened in June and all the way through, I've never known him or Sister Joe to be coming to church in a sense of, oh, woe is us. Or we're going through something where we're such in such great distress. No, but the joy of the Lord is there because you know that God has not left you. You know that His hand is still upon you. And here the disciples uh, uh, and the apostles are going through this great, this, this great persecution for preaching the gospel. But yet there is such great joy in them. And I'm, I'm going against what everyone is going to tell you on God TV and TBN and all these places, which you should not be watching. I watch it only to, because I want to laugh at some things. I don't know. And sometimes I need to know what's happening worldwide in the Christian arena so that I can, I can talk about things that are relevant to what's happening today. Make, make, make reference to it. You know, I heard somebody say the other day on God TV through, a through some kind of revival they were having on TV and the, God wants you to have some joy. Come on, smile. If you just smile for a five seconds, does that mean you have the joy of the Lord? No, you're smiling because I told you to smile. And so everybody smiles and we look at each other and we say, oh, it's happy we've got the joy of the Lord. No, because when you walk out, you're still going to be upset. The joy of the Lord and the joy of what we see in this disciple's heart here was an overflow from the heart. Nobody needed to tell them to smile. It came out of them. It overflowed from them. Nobody said to them, come on, we can have the joy of the Lord. Let's smile. Let's be happy. No, 
This was overflowing from them. God was at work in their heart. And so we find in verse 52, the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And so they went on to preach the gospel. And so must we, beloved, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Ask God to fill you. Ask God to fill you with His Spirit. Remember, there's only one baptism, but many fillings. You only get baptized once in the Spirit, but you get filled many times as God would fill you. And that's one of the things that we're going to be, people might stone us in South Africa as we on the second night of the conference make that statement. I have encouraged my brother who is preaching on that day to make sure that the folks understand there's only one baptism, but many fillings. Because the place that we are going to is a place that people run to the altar every Sunday for the re-baptism of the Holy Spirit. Remember we used to do that? Can you come forward for filling? Can you, I mean, can you come forward for re-baptism, re-baptism, and re-baptism of the Holy Spirit? The Bible does not teach that. It does not teach it. There's only one baptism. God does not baptize you over and over again, but He fills you many, many times. And so we're ready for the stones that are going to come on that night. Uh, but pray for us, not just, not just the, the stones, but the questions. We want the questions to come because we want to uh, say these things almost to provoke them so that they may come to ask us the questions that need to be asked. What do you mean there's only one baptism? And we want to be able to answer those questions. So we're building up a team of re Reformed Evangelical ministers who are not a lot. They're coming together for the conference, and they're going to be on hand to answer the questions that Pentecostal Charismatics and Word of Faith people come to ask. Let us close. I hope that uh, I've done justice to this today, and you've learned some lessons. Let us pray.